So vermicompost, your needs for vermicomposting, you need a bin, obviously you need worms, you need bedding, food, and water. So uh, a lot of the bedding that people start off with is peat moss or cocoa core. Peat moss isn't necessarily sustainable, but it's what people use, that's why I have it on my list. Um, there's another thing called pit moss that this company in Pittsburgh started taking uh, newspaper that would normally be going to waste and they're turning it into um, stuff that's similar to peat moss. And then um, food for worms, you can feed them food waste directly, you can feed them compost or other types of organics. Um, you can, there's also worm food. But I don't, like I said, I don't like to pay for stuff. And then in vermicompost, you want to maintain a moisture level of around 80% moisture. And I don't have a hand test method for that. Uh, but worms breathe through their skin, so they need the moisture to help breathe. And then it also keeps them reproducing well when you have more moist material. You can use leaves for bedding. Yeah, I've used leaves. Um, it, you may want to crumble them up or shred them up some. So initially, I don't know if I've got this in my next slide or not, but when you initially start worms, you want to start with some moist bedding and it's good to soak the bedding rather than just like misting it, soak the bedding and then kind of wring it out and then put it in whatever type of container you have and then start adding. And then when you add your worms, you want to let, let them get acclimated and then start adding food to it. I'm not going to go as in depth about kind of that stuff, more just like the what you need. So the type of worms, uh, there are a few types of composting worms. The main one that's used around the world are uh, Asinia fetida. They're also known as red wigglers, manure worms, tiger worms. And they live in the litter layer. And Rhonda knows better than me. There's three types of worms. What's the other ones other than epigeic? Endogeic and anisic. So some move vertically in the soil and some move horizontally. Is endogeic horizontal? Yeah. Endogeic moves horizontal, anisic. So night crawlers are anisic, right? And they go deeper into the soil and they're bringing up material from the bottom. But what we want are worms that actually live above the layer of the soil and live in the litter layer on the surface. And they're going to be composting stuff in a more natural setting like in a forest. They're going to be composting the litter layer that are above the surface layer. So they work in the top like six to nine inches of litter layer. And they're the best composters. They're going to compost better than other worms. You want about 1,000 to 1,500 worms per square foot of surface area. Um, a thousand, uh, so if you purchase a pound of worms, that's normally about 1,000 worms. And hopefully, you'll have healthy worm compost going. And their population will increase to 1,500 to 2,000 per square feet. And then for vermicomposting, it's best to keep it in a climate between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where they're going to be the most active and feeding the most, feeding and reproducing the most. This is a picture of my hand with some red wigglers. These are actually red wigglers from uh, someone in the audience right here. So management of vermicompost, you want to add a half to an inch of food every two to three days. Um, you know when to feed your worms more food because you'll have what's called the pool table effect. So I've got a worm bin up here, I'll show you in a second, but it's hard to take a picture of, of this as an example because everything's so dark. But when you first feed, here's your, here's your layer in your bin from a side view. And you add your food on top of there and you know it's chunks and stuff like that. And then after a couple days, you're going to come back and it's going to be from all these chunks and different depths. It's going to be a more uniform, kind of flat looking, nice small particle size where you know that the worms have come up and worked through all that material. And then you can add more food. You also want to mist the top layer daily so that you're keeping it nice and moist in there and you don't want to get too much water. But the worms, for their health, need the moisture. And then you want to harvest according to your bin style. And I'll get to, into that in a second here. Uh, so if you've got a small, this is a small bin that I built at Rodale. We did for a 
um, a magazine shoot. This is a plastic container that you can buy at whatever stores. Hopefully you can see the bottoms full of holes there. So I drilled a whole bunch of holes in the bottom of that one. And then I've got holes drilled on the outside for some airflow. This is my bottom container that I sawed up some I sawed up some PVC pieces that are all dirty, but that's just to lift it up off the bottom there to give it some height. To, and this will collect what leachate might come through. I don't normally have leachate. Um, we're going to be talking about leachate later. You don't want to use leachate. So I've got holes in the bottom of that one. This one's going to have some stuff on the bottom. I'm going to try not to make a mess here. You can hopefully see the holes on the bottom of that one, but there's some soil coming through. So the idea with this is that it's a flow through system. You would add your bedding. This one's empty. So you'd put your wet bedding in there, put your worms in there, and then once they get acclimated, I don't want to make a mess in here. Uh, once they get acclimated, you would put more food on top and you would keep building up your layers inside of there. And then the idea is that you've got holes in both of the bottoms of this one. Give me one second here to flip this stuff into this. I'm not making a mess. You can see the material in this one. So then as you get to the top of this one, what you would do that's your working bin. You get up to the top, then you've got your empty bin. You put that on top of this, and then the idea is that you would start feeding this, and then the worms would migrate up through these holes. That's the idea. It doesn't always work that way. Uh, migrate up through these holes into this stuff, and then you could even have an additional, can, like a third one on top of there that they're moving up into. So then the idea is that the ease of harvesting of your materials and not having to get out a bunch of worms, because that's what the hardest part is. So you're hopefully having your worms come up through here, and then you've got a bin with just a few worms, or hopefully no worms, that then you can take all this stuff and use all that material in your garden or for compost tea or whatever. Otherwise, I built a four by eight worm bin. It was about 12 inches deep. I had a four by eight piece of plywood on the bottom. I had a four by eight plywood lid. Um, I made these 12 inches because then I made most use of my plywood and you don't want it too deep anyway because I was saying because of these type of worms are in a thin layer, you really want more of a, a shallow system. It's better to work with a shallow system for this instance. So then in this type of bin, um, also I put in some, this was outdoors, so if you were to have it outdoors, you could use food grade insulation. Um, the pink, is it the pink or the blue? I think it's the blue. Like housing insulation, you know, that's like two inches thick. Uh, cut that down to size to insulate the bottom and the sides and possibly even the lid. And then what you would do is to start on this end and add your material and feed the worms here. And then you would work your way across. This is kind of like the windrow thing I was getting at before. And then the idea is behind, behind this is that as you're feeding the worms, they're using up this material and then you feed them and they're migrating this way. You feed them again and they're continuing to migrate. And the whole idea is that as you're adding material here, the worms are migrating that way. Once you get to this end, then hopefully you don't have worms over here and you can start harvesting this material. It doesn't usually really work that way. You usually have some lingerers that like to hang out and chew stuff up back here. Um, and again, the whole idea behind this is the ease of harvesting because it's so time consuming to have to get worms out of your material. And so you're trying to make a system to where it's easier to get separate your worms from your material. And there are some other ways on smaller scales that I don't really want to get into. But if you look at the book, yes. I was just going to say, I found that the horizontal uh, migration uh, as they go along, if you'll take the beginning part and begin to break it up, and loosen it up and it begins to dry, the worms will come out then. Cool. And they'll, they'll migrate better. Did you hear what she just said? She was saying that if you uh, allow the material to dry a little bit better because of the dry conditions, the worms are more likely to migrate. So that's a good, good point. Um, you threw me off what I was going to say. 
<laughs> oh yeah, the book. Uh, Mary Applehoff, Worms Eat My Garbage. Uh, that's a great starter book on uh, l learning more about worms and, start and starting on a very small scale. And she talks about like using a light bulb method uh, to separate worms out. Um, another great book is Rhonda Sherman's here. and She has a wonderful book called The Worm Farmer's Handbook. And uh, I found that as an excellent resource. She gives history on what to use for worms, gets into management styles, and then she also goes around and shows different uh, types of worm composters and gives you different ideas on like what to do with that. But there's a lot of great information in that. That's more geared for like medium to large scale, where Mary Applehoff's books like real beginners and like just like kind of at home doing stuff. They're both great books though. So this is just a few examples. There are other ways you can do it. They have the the worm pagoda, which is uh, a commercial. You can spend a lot of money on a worm pagoda, or you can make one for just a few dollars like I have. It's the same concept. Um, and then there's large continuous flow through bins or reactors. And I've got a picture of those coming up here. Small flow through bin, we already went through that. What is leak tank? Is Leachate is what the liquid that leaches out from your compost pile. And we're going to get into that this afternoon. But with leachate, you never know. Most of the leachate is going to come out from stuff that nece not, hasn't necessarily gone through the thermophilic phase. So you don't know what it is or what's in it. So you know, if you're a person that's composting food waste and you're not necessarily pre-composting your food waste and putting it through the practices to kill pathogens, you could have, you know, like some spinach with E. coli or something like that in your material, and then water's passing through, collecting that E. coli and putting it into the leachate, and then you're taking that stuff and putting it out under your plants, and you don't want that to happen. <laughs>